I went to college in Kentucky, did a lot of volunteer work in Appalachia, and began to meet draft resistors. When I got out of college, I came to New York and did a number of kind of anti-war things, and I ended up at 339 Lafayette Street, East Pentagon, and working with the Catholic Peace Fellowship. And I think one of the real benefits of working in that building was working with the World War II resistors was getting to know Ralph Dugia and Eva Rodenko in particular, hearing their stories. I met Wally Nelson through Ralph and then his wife Juanita, <clears throat> who became longtime friends, lifelong friends. Um, I met Bob Swan, who was another World War II resistor and one of the founders of the Community for Nonviolent Action, um, and his wife Marge. So when I think about these past wars, I recognize that I've been really deeply influenced personally by these war sisters and really feel that I kind of stand on their shoulders. Um, and it's not just about them as resistors, but also about them as people who really worked um, to eliminate the causes of war. So while World War I has always in a whole lot of ways felt very, very far away for me, right? It's kind of like a, someone my own age, my uh, parents' generation were, were, were World War II folks, um, but I knew nobody from World War I. Um, but those people who worked to oppose and resist that war have influenced all of us in ways that I think until I started really looking deeper, I didn't understand. So the War Resisters League was founded in 1923 by Jesse Wallace Hewan. But the roots of that were in 1915 when Jesse and John Hayes Holmes founded the Anti-Enlistment League, which sought to enroll war resistors um, in opposition of American participation in World War I. So Jesse and Frances Witherspoon and Tracy Migett were three of the women who were very influential in War Resisters League, but were also very active in a number of organizations. There's a book a World Without War, A U.S. Feminist and Pacifist Resisting World War I. And it talked about, particularly Witherspoon and Migat, being immersed, as many of the opposition opponents to World War I were, immersed in the Socialist Party and in suffrage work. Um, and then became more involved in the peace movement as the outbreak of hostilities in Europe began. They arrived in New York City in 1913. I want to quote something that Francis Early wrote in this book. Because sometimes the more things change, the more they stay the same. When Maggot and Witherspoon arrived in New York City in 1913, the peace movement was in disarray. Male-dominated peace associations, composed mostly, uh, composed for the most part of lawyers, sorry, I know where we are, <laughs> politicians and businessmen who sought to establish a legally sanctioned, warless, liberal capitalist global system. They had lost their bearings. The founding in January 1915 of the feminist-oriented National Women's Peace Party marked a new beginning for the peace movement. Its leaders encouraged cooperation with other newly formed liberal, liberal peace organizations such as the high-profile Henry Street Settlement House Anti-Preparedness Committee. Think of all of that put together in terms of that helping, helping to forge a peace coalition that was de dedicated to protecting domestic reform, discouraging militarism and conscription, and preventing U.S. involvement in the war. I think one of the lessons here about looking at resistance to World War I was that kind of holistic, what we now look at as intersectionality, and I think some people think of, that they've invented that in the last few years, that things work together. Um, we also can look at Roger Baldwin, who came to New York City to direct the American Union Against Militarism in 1917, which was a pivotal anti-war group at that time. That board included people like Jane Addams and Norman Thomas, uh, Thomas and John Hayes Holmes, who spent 10 months in jail for resisting to submit to a medical exam after he had actually registered for the draft. So Roger Baldwin steered their work towards civil liberties, a really important part of a foundation of what a lot of the draft uh, um, opposition to war um, 
was about at that point in time. Um, Norman Tom Thomas prepared a pamphlet, Conscription and Conscientious Objection to War, and the American Union Against Militarism created a Bureau of Conscientious Objectors. The Bureau of Legal Advice, uh, uh, which was, uh, which Francis Witherspoon was the executive secretary of, worked closely with the National Civil Liberties Bureau, which was, was the forerunner of American Civil Liberties Union. So we're beginning to see here the kinds of foundational work that, pe that resistors did that have led to the organizations that many of us in this room belong to now. Um, there are, of course, many other folks who are resistors to World War I, num numbers of people whose names we know, like Emma Goldman, um, certainly Jeanette Rankin, who was not one of the only people who opposed that war, but was the only person who opposed both World War I and World War II, as we know, and the only person who opposed World War II. Uh, last week or so, I heard on Terry Gross uh, Kate Hennessy. Kate is the granddaughter of Dorothy Day, and she's just recently written a book, and she was um, talking about her, her grandmother um, and some of the history, and she said that um, Dorothy worked for the masses, was a, a journalist, and wrote for the masses, which was closed down because they came out against conscription to World War I. So it was that recent status of unemployment, she ran into a friend who said, we're, um, we're demonstrating in Washington, you know, the suffrage movement, we're looking for more people to come down, will you? And so Dorothy went to Washington, was arrested for the first time, was in jail for many days, had nothing to read but a Bible, started reading the Psalms, many years later became a Catholic and founded the Catholic Worker. <laughs> so, all of these kinds of things that kind of were really planted and rooted so much in that opposition to war, but also in the women's suffrage movement, also in what was happening locally. One of the stories that you read over and over again is how much people spend time also going to the prisons, visiting the people who are in there, the conditions being um, really horrendous at that period of time. Um, and I know Maria is going to speak more about conscientious objectors. I'm, I'm kind of more the storyteller than the statistician here, um, but I think we remember more when we hear the stories. Um, so um, I think there were, there were, we know there were many more resistors to World War II than there were to World War I. But the, one of the really important crucial things to remember is the World War I resistors who were in such an isolated space in, in so many ways and were, were really treated so horrendously in prison were there continue to work. They didn't stop their opposition to war. They didn't stop trying to create a culture of peace in, in so many ways. And so they were there as the world seemed to be marching towards another war. They were there um, both in, in support of those, um, those World War II resistors um, and um, the, kind of the organization such as War War Sisters League and, and Fellowship of Reconciliation, which had been founded around that time. Um, sorry, I feel like I've lost something here in terms of part of the story. But, um, okay, here we are. So um, there were groups like Women's International League for, Pe for Peace and Freedom, uh, Quaker groups, and others that began to work more and more together, and particularly moving into the early 19, into the mid-1930s, there was a um, No More War Parade Committee, which included 55 groups, and I read through the War Sisters League 1998 calendar on our 75th anniversary had one of the flyers for that demonstration at Judson Ch Memorial Church, which is what, three doors down, was one of the groups along with War Sisters League and Fellowship of Reconciliation who were part of the, um, part of that, um, a group of 55 people. Um, in 1939, many of the World War I resistors were part of um, a group of people who started a journal called The Conscientious Objector, which really kept up with and, and supported the, the war resistors. It also, at that time, was beginning to write more and more about what was happening in India and the growing movement, the growing nonviolent movement um, for Indian independence. Um, 
FDR signed the controversial draft registration bill in September of 1940, and CO status at that point was limited to only um, only religious objectors, just like it had been in, in World War I. So while the, that policy was a little more liberal by World War II, it was still very, very narrow. It actually stayed narrow until the, the Vietnam War in many ways. Um, Non-religious pacifists, as well as a few religious pacifists, refused to cooperate and, with, and, and refused to go into the civilian public service camps, which they saw as, as labor camps. And so they all ended up um, in prison as well, uh, along with other non-cooperators. So, but the small number of people who ended up in prison belies in some ways the result of what they did. Um, Bayard Rustin, one of the Draftry sisters, an African American who was influenced by his Quaker grandmother, um, as we know, was one of the, was the key organizer and strategist for the March on Washington for jobs and justice. Remember, it was also <laughs> wider than a March on Washington for desegregation. He was also one of the first people to take this experiment in nonviolence that he saw happening in India and begin to experiment with it around desegregation in the United States. In 1940, there was a Harlem ashram that included many people who later became war resistors and who had been war resistors in developing ideas of nonviolence, nonviolence training, nonviolent action um, against segregation. War resistors in Danbury Prison desegregated the prison through a hunger strike, which lasted for quite a while. Um, the first freedom rides in the United States in 1947 were organized by war resistors, by Breston and George Hauser were the key organizers, and they also did early nonviolence training, one of the first half dozen nonviolence trainings. So all of this thinking about how we prevent war and what kind of, what are we, who are we standing on? Whose, whose steps are we walking in? How do we recognize <coughs> the role of these war sisters? Wally Nelson, the son of a sharecropper, um, was also in prison uh, during World War II and then became the first nonviolence trainer for Congress of Racial Equality. And he and his wife Juanita were two of the five people who began the present day war tax resistance movement and it was been very inspirational in that. Roy Kepler, another war resistor who was out east for a while, went out west and started this thing called Pacifica Radio, which is not named after the Pacific Ocean, but named after pacifism. <laughs> a little known <laughs> piece of history there. Bob Swan, who had worked with Frank Lloyd Wright, um, began to look at nonviolent economics, kind of Gandhian economics and created the Community Land Trust, which now has over 250 around the country, and also worked with Seymour Melvin on economic conversion. I could go on and on. Dave Dellinger needs to be also mentioned as somebody who spent time in prison during that war. So but what I want to try to draw out here is the similarities between the World War I and the World War II resistors, in that they were not simply war resistors. I, I say simply we're really because that's clearly, it was not simple. Um, but they were deeply committed to that level of resistance, but also in that, what Gandhi called constructive program, but the, a term most of them did not use, but, or a culture of peace, whatever, but really deeply committed to um, building a better world and working at those um, root causes of war. So it's important to remember that Martin Luther King Jr. was greatly influenced by this group of people. That it was by Augustine who early on went to Montgomery and gave him support. Um, yep, thank you. Um, it was, so in April, uh, 50 years ago, April 4th, 1967, when he said our only hope today lies in our ability to recapture the revolutionary spirit and go out into a sometimes hostile world declaring eternal hostility to poverty, racism, and militarism. While that was really controversial at the time and many felt he was breaking rank, I think he was really 
stepping up into kind of a force that he understood as being really a kind of wisdom that said we cannot work against war if we do not work against economic injustice, if we don't work against racism, if we don't work against those forms of oppression. Um, I, okay, I'm going to tell a quick story, but I'll, I'll wait and do that. But so um, I think that by the time we get to the Vietnam War, in some ways we've come a little full circle because now we have the second wave of feminism. And so the, the women of my age were doing some of the same kinds of exploring and talking and discussing about the issues of masculinity and war that the women did in 1915, 16, 17, and on. So really, you, you see that um, same kind of framework. So I'm kind of thinking about this on the train coming down and thinking, when will it ever end? And we just kind of having to keep raising this discussion over and over again. But I feel like we are making progress. Um, I want to, I've got a couple minutes, I want to um, kind of end with is it, um, a, another paragraph from Francis Early's World Without War, because I think for me the lesson here is really, it's about resistance, it's about looking at the, the kind of modeling of resistance that we saw by um, so many people in World War I, and particularly so many women who stepped forward in World War I, but it's also about that bigger piece of the work that they were involved in. When we reflect upon the history of women and men of the peace and freedom movements in World War I America, we can identify the coming into being of a peace culture, a new way of thinking about behaving in the world. The peoples whose lives we glimpsed and experienced the, and experienced the imperative to combat war and to build peace, a process that they perceived was at once political and personal. Again, you see the, the connection there. Despite the tensions and conflicts and uncertainties that assailed them at every turn, they labored indefatigably for concrete outcomes at the same time that they sought lives of happiness for themselves and for those they loved. Doubtless, such individuals were, were they still alive today, would agree with the feminist peace activist and theoretician Ursula Franklin that, quote, pacifism is not anti-war. Pacifism is the advocacy of a life in which the roots of war are attacked and war is unnecessary. So we have a lot of attacking we have to do with those roots of war these days. Thank you. Thank you, Joanne. Uh, Next, still on resistance to World War I and other wars, Maria Santelli is the executive director of the Sentence Center on Conscience and War. Maria Santelli. All right. Thank you all so much for being here. It's such a great privilege for us to be able to speak with you about the work that we do and the huge footsteps that we follow in, can you see my face over this? <laughs> I'm on my toes. I can do it, I'm used to it. <laughs> if I were to obey your call, I would be a traitor to my conscience. Those are the words of William Yasmagi, a Lutheran and socialist, and he wrote those words to his draft board on Long Island on December 4th, 1917 upon receiving notice to report for military service in the First World War. A century ago this week, as we've said, we're standing here marking the anniversary of the official U.S. entry into World War I. Soon after that, on May 18, 1917, the Selective Service Act, the World War I draft law, set in motion a series of events that would forever alter countless lives and continues to touch our lives today. The law attempted to provide for conscientious objectors, but the protections that were afforded were weak and inadequate, to say the least. To qualify as a CO, as, jo as Joanne alluded to, it was even more restrictive in World War I than World War II, but to qualify as a CO, a conscientious objector, in World War I, you had to be a member of a church that had an official statement prohibiting its members from participating in war on the books at the time that the draft law was signed. 
So of course that meant that many legitimate conscientious objectors who were not members of such a church were automatically disqualified. Even those COs who could meet the strict requirements of the law were still subject to military service upon being drafted, albeit they were non-combatant roles, such as cooks or medics, but very clearly in support of the war effort, as everyone knows. Between May 1917 and November 1918, 64,000 conscientious objector applications were filed with Selective Service. About 20,000 of those COs ended up being drafted, and most of them accepted the non-combat military service. Initially, about 4,000 of those men, though, refused to perform any work in support of the military. But under the law, once an individual was drafted, he, because they were all men, right, he was considered to be in the military, whether he agreed to it or not. Consequently, consequently, the resistors were taken to military camps or prisons to be persuaded, often with violence, abuse, and torture, to perform military service. This is how he treated the men whose crime was refusing to take another human life. About a third of those initial resistors were persuaded by this torture and abuse, and they eventually did accept non-combatant military service, often as, an end, often as a means to bring to an end to the abuse and torture that they endured at the hands of the United States Army. In his book, Jailed for Peace, Stephen Cohen describes some of that persuasion. The treatment of World War I resistors was barbaric. At least 17 objectors died in jail as a direct consequence of torture or poor prison conditions. Others were driven insane. Common punishment for COs and other military prisoners consisted of two consecutive weeks in solitary confinement on a bread and water diet in a completely dark cell, chained or handcuffed to the wall for nine hours a day. Objectors were imprisoned in unsanitary guard houses, often without blankets, in unheated cells during the winter months. Men forcibly clad in military uniform, beaten, pricked or stabbed with bayonets, jerked about with ropes on their necks, threatened with summary execution. In at least two cases, men were immersed in the filth of latrines. Remember their crime, refusing to take another human life. In the end, some 500 conscientious objectors who resisted military service were tried by military court-martial. 345 of these conscientious objectors were sent, received jail sentences. 142 of those sentences were life. 17 of those sentences were death. And although no one was executed, as we know, at least that many died as a result of the abuse they endured in prison. The punishment of conscientious objectors during World War I in the United States was far more severe than that uh, meted out by England and Germany, where maximum sentences were two and four years, respectively. The average sentence for an American conscientious objector was longer than 16 and a half years. Think about that in terms of the sentences people serve today for different crimes. 16 and a half years for refusing to kill. On November 8th, 1918, fighting ceased and the Great War came to an end. Armistice Day was intended to be marked every year in honor of the cause of world peace. The war to end all wars wasn't, of course, and has been followed by a century of nearly continuous war to this day. The November 11th holiday was updated to reflect this common state of perpetual war in 1954. And we now know it as Veterans Day, meant to keep our focus on war and the warrior, overshadowing and perhaps intentionally erasing the promise of world peace and the experiences of conscientious objectors from World War I. After the First World War ended, there was some debate on whether the horrifying accounts of the brutal treatment of the men who refused to kill were real. The talking point was that the conscientious objectors were treated with leniency. But the truth was recorded in letters, diaries, and family and community histories. It also was entered into the congressional record on March 4th, 1919, in testimony provided by the National Civil Liberties Bureau. Quote, at the United States Disciplinary Barracks at Alcatraz, right? That's where we kept our COs, Alcatraz. Four religious objectors, Reed Hoffer brothers and Jacob Wiff, were placed 
per in a perfectly dark dungeon where water seeped in from the sea, their outer clothing removed, and where they were fed only small amounts of bread and water. At the end of the fifth day, they were removed by recommendation of the medical examiner and placed in isolation. Later, they were transferred to Fort, Le transferred to Fort Leavenworth. Two of the brothers died of pneumonia within 10 days of their arrival. The body of one of these men was sent home, dressed in the military uniform of the United States Army, the one he had gone to prison because he refused to, to wear. It eventually became clear to their jailers that no amount of abuse, torture, humiliation, or ridicule could force the COs to compromise their beliefs in any way. So why go to such lengths to punish a person who will not fight? Why try to coerce a person into denying their most fundamental values and principles? The answer to that is that the violence of war is not natural for humanity. It must be taught and continually reinforced. The inevitability of violence and injustice is a myth, a myth that persists at the hands of media and government who choose to strengthen their own influence and harden their own power by sowing fear and division among our communities. It is a myth that is reinforced subtly like by changing the name of a day to celebrate peace, to remind us of war, and it is a myth that is reinforced aggressively by drill sergeants. In our work at the Center on Conscience and War, the stories of the conscientious objectors we work with serve as daily reminders and individual case studies that prove that humanity is naturally predisposed to peace. Our conscience tells us cooperation with one another is right, and injustice and violence against one another is wrong. In a time when it feels like the military and the culture of violence have colonized so much of our lives, our lands, our economy, our culture, and in many cases, even our churches, there is one part of us that cannot be colonized, at least not permanently, and that is the conscience. And that fact poses a great threat to the ability to make and perpetuate war. Presbyterian minister and conscientious objector Norman Thomas wrote of the objectors in World War I, quote, this insignificant fraction of youth of America challenged the power of the state when it was mightiest and the philosophy of war when it was most pervasive. They said, you may kill us, but you can't make us fight against our will. They said it not as men who court martyrdom, but as men who serve principle. Not as those who despised the state, but as those who refused to make it God. If enough of them had said that thing in every land, there would have been no war. And that is the thing that the military and the state know very well. And it is evident in the lengths they will go to to try and make kids into killers. Basic military training is a science expressly designed to circumvent the conscience, to teach a soldier to kill by rote reflexively, without thinking and without filtering through the conscience. We must be programmed to kill. If killing was natural, it would come easily for us, be good for us, and allow us to thrive. Hundreds of thousands of veterans struggling with the trauma of moral injury, wounds to the soul caused by a transgression against the conscience, are poignant proof of our tragic misunderstanding of our own nature. With deep gratitude to the sacrifices made by COs of a century ago, the COs of today don't have to choose between violating their orders or violating their conscience. They have a third choice, applying for discharge, and that choice allows them to seek and receive real justice. In the years just preceding U.S. entry to World War II, the founders of our organization worked to influence that generation's draft law to include real, enforceable protections for COs. There would be no more court martials, no more torture, though the emotional and sometimes physical abuse continues. During the draft years from World War II and forward, COs could perform civilian service instead of being forced to perform support roles for war. Pentagon policy modeled after that 1940 draft law allows modern COs in our all recruited military to legally apply for discharge as conscientious objectors. And many individuals do just that, especially now when even the lowest ranking private can easily observe a clear move toward an even, great, even greater militarization of the United States already over-militarized approach to foreign policy. Between 2015 and 2016, the Center on Conscience and War experienced a 62% increase in the number of CO applicants that we work with. 
like this one. 18-year-old Zach from rural North Carolina wanted to be a soldier since he was a little boy. He didn't join because he wanted to take other human lives, but because he wanted to make something better of his own. When he arrived at basic training, it didn't take him long to realize the Army didn't care what he wanted. They're trying to make me a killer, he told me, choking back tears. When he refused their training, he was physically and emotionally abused. In his jail cell at Fort, Benning, or at Fort Benning, he looked down at his belt and up at the rafters. But thankfully, he didn't take that step. He found a way out. He found a way to follow his conscience. Just as countless men and women have done throughout history, as long as there have war, has been war, there have been conscientious objectors, because that is who we are. As we go forward in our own work to build peace and end war, we lift up the stories of those who suffer for having fought and those who suffer for having refused to fight. Both teach the same lesson. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. She said all that standing on her toes. <laughs> Glenn Ford is an activist, a journalist, a radio host, the executive editor of the wonderful Black Agenda Report. The great Glenn Ford. Power to the people. It's like I won't have to stand on my toes. Uh, you know, most of the time when we invoke uh, the memory of Dr. King, uh, it's usually within the context of uh, the terms human rights and civil rights. Uh, but today it's going to be in the context of peace. Uh, and I think that that is proper, and I think it's righteous, and I think it's the best way to look at Dr. Uh, King. Uh, the civilizational project of humanity uh, is what we're really talking about, not these words that get pigeonholed like civil rights and even uh, human rights. Uh, the civilizational project isn't just about wealth. It's not about uh, building up a surplus. It's about what human beings do, how they construct a society that distributes that uh, surplus, uh, how they construct a society that allows them to thrive and to coexist uh, within the bosom of nature of which they are a part. Uh, the civilizational project is almost by definition a justice project. Civilization, again, is not about technology and amassing wealth. It's about, uh, well, how we treat each other and how we codify that, uh, and that's what civilizations are. Um, the black radical tradition is about justice. It is a civilization building tradition. Justice is the measure of civilization and there can be no peace without it. Of necessity, historically, the black radical tradition speaks to the broad sweep of human historical development and there is nothing narrow or parochial about it. And that's why I like to speak uh, of Dr. Luther, Martin Luther King uh, in uh, these larger terms. Uh, sometimes the black radical tradition finds the perfect voice and finds that voice at a pivotal time and that was Dr. King's voice on April 4th, 1967 when he told his audience at Riverside Church that their country was the greatest purveyor of violence in the world and that it was because it was under a damnable system that had created this nightmare and that righteous men and women had no choice but to oppose that system. He could not be pigeonholed as just a man of civil rights. He couldn't be narrowly packaged as just uh, addressing issues that were only uh, relevant to a certain segment of the public and uh, those who sympathize with that public. Dr. King spoke, of course, and you've all heard uh, about the triple evils, racism and militarism and materialism, and by materialism uh, he quite obviously meant, uh, speaking from contemporary society, he was talking about capitalism. The sum total of these three triple evils is U.S. imperialism, 
is that system uh, that creates, uh, that pervades uh, all of this violence in the world, the system that he came to the church that day uh, to oppose, the system of capitalism as it actually exists. It was not a theoretical uh, conversation. When Dr. King said that the arc of, more of the moral universe is long, but that it bends towards justice, he was expressing confidence that humanity would throw off, or turn that around, overthrow these evil systems. That didn't sit very well with the rulers, and uh, exactly a year later, Dr. King was dead. But that did not silence the voice of black anti-imperialism, because he was not the only voice of black anti-imperialism. He was only one of many of uh, those voices including Dr. King's own, had gotten even louder and more defiant after the assassination of Malcolm X three years earlier. Uh, SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, uh, a group that lots of folks uh, like to say were, were the children of the SCLC, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, Dr. King's organization. Uh, they had years earlier uh, taken up agitation against the war and against the draft. They took up that agitation uh, before Dr. King did. Uh, they had taken up the anti-imperialist banner uh, years after W.E.B. Du Bois, uh, who suffered exile for his crimes against war. <laughs> and after the erasure from public life of Paul Robeson, who had at one point uh, been the most popular entertainer uh, in the United States and was uh, uh, relegated to non-personhood. When Dr. King was shot down, there erupted the greatest rebellion, black rebellion, in the history of the United States. That rebellion was fueled and fueled the explosive growth of the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense, whose appeal was so compelling that the chapter infrastructure of the still very young party at that time could not absorb the tens of thousands of black youth who wanted to get into the Black Panther Party. It was a revolutionary black nationalism that was profoundly anti-imperialist and proudly and loudly socialist. It was a movement that was determined to join with a world that was at that point in history up in arms against the U.S. empire. It was Malcolm X's child and some of them thought uh, of themselves as being Dr. King's revenge. Therefore, that movement had to be crushed by the massive repressive forces of the state in a dirty war that reached its most savage peak in the year 1969 with the merciless campaign of political imprisonment and the murder of many Panthers, including Fred Hampton and Mark Clark by the Chicago police and the FBI uh, in Chicago. The party at the end of 1969, by the end of 69, uh, had already been driven into retreat, uh, and it retreated to its founding turf in Oakland, California. However, that was not this, the real story or the total story of the uh, demise of the Black Panther Party. Uh, the decisive blow uh, against that representation of uh, militant anti-imperialism uh, and self-determinationist uh, motivations uh, in black America, the, the decisive blow against that uh, was struck by forces that were internal to the black community. It came from a class of people that had not been concerned about justice in any civilizational sense, but only about getting rid of Jim Crow about defeating American apartheid so that they could also walk in the halls of the empire and live a good corporate life. That's what the movement meant to them. That's what victory meant to them. 
their vehicle, and it was their vehicle because it was the only car with the door open to them, was the Democratic Party. They couldn't get in that other car because the other car, the Republicans, were busy turning themselves into the white man's party. So that was not an option. With a very, very few exceptions, this was a class that was out for itself. It was consumed by a mission of representationalism. They wanted no part of real social transformation that went beyond getting rid of apartheid. They wanted only that black people be represented in the upper echelons of corporate and governmental and symbolic media power. The soul of their agenda was the opportunity for their own upward mobility. They were not about justice in any real sense, and they were not about peace. We call them at Black Agenda Report the black misleadership class, and that's why we call them that. Hmm. Two examples of that class uh, from founding members of the black misleadership class. Carl Stokes, elected the first black mayor of Cleveland, in fact, the first uh, big city black mayor in the history of the country. And the first thing that the first black mayor did was to appoint the first black police chief of Cleveland. And the first thing that the first black police chief of Cleveland did was to issue um, hollow point bullets to the cops. This guy was a former general. Maynard Jackson was the first black mayor of Atlanta, Georgia, elected in 1973. Four years later, he fired all 1,000 striking, and these were all black folks virtually, all fired 1,000 striking garbage workers, maintenance work, uh, sanitation workers. These are the same people that Dr. King, nine years earlier, went to Memphis to support and died trying to support them. Maynard Jackson showed what the black misleadership class is about. The rise of this selfish, servile, corporate ass-kissing class, combined with the murderous application of state power, snuffed out the black liberation movement, which was anti-imperialist to the core. There was a brief resurgence of this black movement kind of politics with the campaign against South African apartheid in the 80s, but it was only a very brief. For two generations now, black movement politics was smothered by the hegemonic power of the Democratic Party in black America. This party's tentacles have strangled the militancy out of virtually every black civic organization. The churches and the fraternities and the sororities all behaved especially during election years, as annexes of the Democratic Party. You can't find a place to meet without running into a horde of Democrats wondering if you're going to hurt the interests of the party or their, their club. They invoke Dr. King. They're invoking today. They'll be invoking tomorrow. They invoke Dr. King, and they use the word justice a lot, and every once in a while they say the word peace. But justice and peace cannot find a home in one of the two war parties. You can't exist with that. The question then becomes, and this is the heavy question, this is the one that we wrestle with every day. Does two generations without a real peace and social justice movement in black America mean that the black radical tradition has been crushed? have the historically most left-leaning constituency in the United States, and that is black people. That's verified by uh, every poll that's ever been taken that has uh, actually tracked black folks. Uh, has that most left-leaning constituency shed their anti-imperialism and embraced war? The most definitive answer that I've come across that I've seen uh, came in a Zogby poll uh, that uh, came out in March of 2003. The poll was taken in February. That's about, uh, about three weeks uh, before 
uh, Bush crossed the line uh, into Iraq. This was a war that when the poll was being conducted, everybody uh, knew was coming. Uh, the Zogby poll, uh, which is uh, run by some uh, Arab Americans, uh, asked a very straightforward question, a kind of question you don't usually get uh, from these corporate pollsters. And this is the question uh, verbatim. Would you support an invasion of Iraq if it resulted in the death of thousands of Iraqi civilians? A supermajority, something like 70% of white males said, yep, let's get it on. A bare majority, a little over 50%, of white females said the same thing. 16% of Hispanic Americans agreed uh, that they would go to war with Iraq under those circumstances uh, in which uh, thousands of Iraqi civilians would be killed. But only 7% of black Americans said that they would support an invasion under those circumstances. That means that only a very marginal segment of black America had any willingness to kill Iraqi men, women, and children. And that is a world view that was worlds apart from the white male and female world view of that time. And I think that that is very strong evidence that black people remained anti-imperialist in their souls despite two generations without a movement that was loudly and proudly and defiantly anti-imperialist. And that says something. Then came, however, the first black president, <laughs> Barack Obama. And I got to tell you, uh, we at Black Agenda Report really dreaded that coming, uh, not just because he was black, but because we understood and knew Barack Obama. Bruce Dixon had worked with Obama in the 90s and gone to his, his wedding. And in fact, when uh, Barack Obama um, decided that he was going to run for Senate, nobody outside of Chicago seemed to know him. I asked Bruce about it. He said, you want his number? And we soon were uh, interrogating him on a number of issues. So we followed him very, very closely from uh, I think it was 2003, uh, all the way up to his presidential announcement. Uh, and we studied uh, his speeches, especially the ones uh, that he gave to the Chicago, Chicago uh, affiliate of the uh, Council on Foreign Affairs, uh, the corporate uh, folks who mind the world. Uh, and these were speeches that were his most detailed and frank and uh, scholarly as well as political. Uh, of, of any of the others. There, there was very, very little obfuscation. Uh, he, he kept these guys informed as to exactly what he, he would do. And uh, he was quite clearly uh, a, a war uh, president. Uh, so we uh, were very anxious about the rise of this guy who we knew would be a war president. Uh, we worried about the effect that his presence in the Oval Office would have on black political behavior and on the black world view. And we feared for the worst, and we got it, the worst. Uh, the problem that we foresaw was that at root, uh, black people for the first time in history might begin to identify with US national power if one of their number personified that power. That is a very, very uh, heady brew uh, for people who had been rendered invisible uh, for most of their time in North America. And now you or someone you think is like you uh, is in the Oval Office. Uh, uh, there was never any question how the black misleadership class would react to having a black Democrat uh, in office. Uh, their agenda uh, is to stick as close to power as they can and to celebrate blacks being represented in power. Uh, even if that person is engaged in crimes against humanity and crimes against uh, peace. 
And, and so the blackness leadership class, the black political class, did not surprise us in terms of their behavior uh, during the tenure of this uh, war uh, president. Uh, back in 2002, when Bush was asking for his war powers, uh, powers, uh, only four members of the Congressional Black Caucus uh, went along with that. Uh, but by June of 2011, when the United States and NATO are doing their uh, regime change mission uh, in Libya, more than half of the Congressional Black Caucus, uh, 24 members, gave their full permission and assent and endorsement to uh, Obama's continued bombing uh, of, of Libya. And more than that, 31 of the 40 or so voting members, 31 of them continued uh, uh, to uh, vote uh, for spending money on the whole Libyan uh, regime change uh, operation, which is basically the same thing. And that includes John Lewis, who people in Atlanta call the Lord, uh, who cloaks himself in all the vestments uh, of Martin Luther King. He also voted to continue the funding for that war, AFRICOM's first war on Africa. And uh, Keith Ellison called that war a blow for freedom and self-determination, I guess U.S. freedom uh, to determine uh, everybody else's fate but itself. The black masses was a different story, and it's, it's very difficult uh, to measure that, uh, but there was some disturbing uh, evidence about the effect uh, that the Obama presidency was having on that bedrock anti-imperialism uh, historically of black people. Uh, you remember back in late August of 2013, Obama on a uh, pretext uh, threatened to make airstrikes against uh, Syria. Uh, polls showed that 40% of black Americans would have supported such an airstrike on Syria. Uh, compared to only 38% uh, of whites and a smaller percentage of Hispanic Americans. Now, only minorities of any group of Americans uh, supported Obama's threatened strike. But this is the first poll in the history of polling in which more black people were for a warlike action than white people. And re compare that to the 7% for the invasion uh, of Iraq under those circumstances compared to 70% of white males and more than 50% of white females. And now we have this black president in office and black folks are more for bombing uh, than white folks. So there has uh, been uh, an effect. Now, you know, with this change uh, of regime, uh, uh, as, as one who never believed that an almost unified ruling class under the Democratic Party in uh, Hillary's big nasty tent uh, could not defeat a Donald Trump, and I was wrong. So I uh, hesitate now. <laughs> I hesitate now to make to make predictions uh, about how folks uh, react uh, under a Trump uh, presidency. I'm talking about black folks. Uh, will will that be a a release? Uh, for pent-up militancy or, or, or fear. Uh, I don't know. Uh, but there is some, the disturbing, the disturbing aspect is that uh, with this Russia, uh, anti-Russia uh, hysteria, where we see the entirety of the uh, Black Caucus, basically the entirety of the uh, blackness leadership class uh, uh, bad-mouthing the Russians, uh, at, at the same uh, pace and with the same level of insanity uh, as, their, as their white counterparts. And what really disturbed me, uh, and I'm going to finish in just a second, <laughs> what really disturbed me, I was talking to uh, a, a gentleman, a brother, uh, who styles himself as head of the revolutionary Black Panther Party. They have some chapters around uh, the country. I was interviewing him because the police had, as we used to say, vamped on them uh, in Milwaukee. So I'm, I'm going to give him a little uh, publicity. And unprovoked, unprompted, out of the blue, he starts talking about them damn Russians. And he's supposed to be a revolutionary Black Panther. Now this sickness is, has, uh, this, is this is what uh, Dr. Uh, Gerald Horn uh, calls when he talks about what's uh, afflicting 
the ruling circles in the United States, the Putin derangement syndrome. <laughs> and somehow it is filtered down to even black folks who think that they are heads of the revolutionary Black Panther Party. So we have a, a deep problem, which I have not diagnosed, and time being up, I won't. <laughs> Alice Slater is the New York Director of the New Age Peace Foundation, a member of the Global Council of Abolition 2000, and on the World Beyond War Coordinating Committee. Alice Slater. Actually, my, the end of my speech is how the baloney about the, the Putin bashing and how we actually got to that. And my beat these days is banning the bomb, banning nuclear weapons, and if we don't have a good relationship with Putin, forget about it. There are uh, 15,000 nukes on the planet, 14,000 are in the U.S. and Russia. All the other countries, there are nine altogether, I'll go through it, it's England, France, China, India, Pakistan, Israel, and North Korea, the latest new baby on the block. All of them have a thousand. So it's really up to us and Russia to ban the bomb. And there's been a very uh, extraordinary occurrence. Last week, I was at the UN every day for a whole week. There's a group meeting that was created by the UN General Assembly that works with majority vote, no super votes, no vetoes, to create a treaty to ban nuclear weapons and prohibit them. Believe it or not, they've never been prohibited. We have a treaty to ban chemical weapons, a treaty to ban biological weapons, we did landmines, we did cluster bombs, which Hillary voted against. And we never ban nuclear weapons because we have this it's, it's like the arms control equivalent of Obamacare. It's called the Non-Proliferation Treaty. And it was signed in 1970. And five nuclear weapon states, US, Russia, England, China, and France, promised to make good faith efforts to give up their nuclear weapons. And the rest of the world promised not to get them, except India, Pakistan, and Israel, they didn't promise, so they got them. And this Faustian bargain to sweeten the pot and get everybody to say they weren't going to get nuclear weapons, we gave them, and this is the language of the treaty, an inalienable right to peaceful nuclear power. I mean, inalienable right to life, liberty, pursuit of happiness, and peaceful nuclear power? What is that about? And of course, every peaceful reactor is a bomb factory. I mean, that's, North Korea was a member, they got their peaceful nuclear power, and they walked out to make their bomb. And uh, that's what we were upset about with Iran, you know, which we were, really, that was a very, good anti-imperialist movements in America where we didn't let the country bomb Iran. I mean, there was a lot of grassroots pressure, and Schumer monster, he voted to bomb Iran, so we're New Yorkers, you know, keep that in mind. Um, anyway, so here it is. They signed the treaty in 1970. There's still 9,000 bombs on the planet. Obama's con con uh, committed to a trillion dollars over the next 30 years for two new bomb factories and new missiles, bombers, uh, and submarines, delivery systems. So obviously something's wrong. And in 2000, well anyway, like four years ago, as a result of, this of a big statement by the International Committee of Red Cross on the humanitarian, catastrophic humanitarian effects of nuclear war, there were a series of three meetings in Oslo, in Mexico, and in Vienna to look at the catastrophic consequences of nuclear war, the humanitarian effects and this 
alter the public conversation because up till then they were talking about security, we need it for our security, you know, and I, I read this wonderful thing. I want to give you a quote from this uh, Elliot Sperber. He's a writer. He came to a Code Pink meeting yesterday and he just like handed me the perfect quote for us. He's talking about his security because what we had here now, like we shifted the the uh, the paradigm. It's no longer security about nuclear weapons. You know, they said we need it for our deterrence, but now it's about the humanitarian catastrophe. That's what people are talking about. And even the Pope Francis sent a message to the Vienna meeting, and again last week, because the Catholic Church had an exception always for deterrence. And the International Court of Justice said, well, we can't say if they're always illegal in the very case where the very survival of a state is at stake, we're not going to judge whether they're illegal or not. So into this legal gap came the ban treaty. With these three meetings, we wound up, the UN General Assembly voted to have these negotiations, and last week was a week of negotiations, picketed by all the nuclear weapon states. Now what was interesting in the October vote, uh, you know, the Western states and Israel voted no, but India, China, and Pakistan abstained. And guess what? North Korea voted to ban the bomb. I'm sure you saw that front page New York Times. <laughs> so anyway, but I think with Trump, was it's been so nuts, you know, China was afraid he was going to recognize Taiwan. I think, so they all, none of the nuclear weapon states came. And Trump's new uh, Madam Secretary of State, which gives a, a, a bad name to women, she stood outside the conference on the opening day with the door shut, flanked by the ambassador from England and the ambassador from France and said, we're boycotting the meeting. And 132 countries are in there negotiating. I mean, like, this was terrific. Oh, and she opened it up, I'm a mother. So I need bombs, you know. <laughs> anyway, you know, we have to look at what this woman's thing is. The New York Times had a women's section this Sunday. Anybody see it? They featured Hallie, Nikki, the Snicky Hallie, you know, the, the nuclear bomber. How women are making progress, and they had women from different movements, not one from the peace movement. I didn't see Medea Benjamin there, you know. I didn't see Phyllis Bennis. In the, they were featured, or jo, you know, Joanne. They were featuring, you know, famous women that took big roles in, in key issues in the United States. Nothing about peace. We had to actually fight to get peace into the climate march. You know, when we're talking about putting everything together in the store, we couldn't get it in. So anyway, back to the UN. It was the most incredible thing I've ever done. I've been going to these UN meetings since 1995 when they renewed the NPT and they lock the doors, they keep all the civil society in the halls while they're negotiating so you don't know what they're saying, you know. Well, None of the nuclear weapon states were there, so we had 132 countries, a lot of leadership from Mexico, Austria, Ireland. By the way, Ireland <coughs> just announced that nothing the government ever invests in is going to be fossil fuel. The whole country. That was yesterday I read that. So there's this, this stuff happening, you know, somehow, in spite of everybody. And, uh, it was wonderful, like we had back and forth dialogue, you know, usually they gave us, you know, a half hour, NGOs made their statements, but NGOs is a non-governmental organization, <laughs> it's an acronym. But anyway, so the, the citizens were talking back and forth and trading ideas and they're going to meet again in, uh, oh, and the chair was a wonderful woman from Costa Rica, the ambassador from Costa Rica. And they're going to meet again in the last week in June, first week in July, and they expect to have a treaty. They took all the input, and she's going to do a draft, and they're going to come back, and they agree on almost everything. I mean, there's questions about 
if the nuclear weapon states want to join, do they have to give up their weapons before they join, or can we let them join with a time frame? You know, and to, you know, there's these kinds of things that they're discussing. But basically, we're going to ban the bomb, which is wonderful. Um, I just, in terms of uh, Martin Luther King, he he spoke about uh, nuclear disarmament. I mean, he he said some fabulous things uh, in 1957. I definitely feel that the development and use of nuclear weapons should be banned. See, so we're doing it, Martin. <laughs> it cannot be disputed that a full-scale nuclear war would be utterly catastrophic. Hundreds of millions of people would be killed outright by the blast and heat and by the ionizing radiation produced at the instant explosion. Even countries not directly hit by bombs but suffer through global fallouts. This is exactly what we were learning in this humanitarian conference. And all of this leads me to say the principal objective of all nations must be the total abolition of war. War must be finally eliminated or the whole of mankind will be plunged into the abyss of annihilation. And then in 1959, just five months after he was stabbed in Harlem, he addressed the War Resisters League, uh, 36th Annual Dinner, he praised its work, and linked the domestic struggle for racial justice with the campaign for global disarmament. Not only in the South, but throughout the nation and the world, we live in an age of conflicts, an age of biological weapons, chemical weapons, warfare, atomic fallout, and nuclear bombs. Every man, woman, and child lives not knowing if they shall see tomorrow's sunrise. And there were other statements. I mean, he really got it. And in a sense, what we've done now is change this conversation from we need them for our security, we need them for our deterrence. You know, the fear factor, the security. Um, did I read the quote to you yet about security that I picked up? No. Okay. This guy, Elliot Sperber, that I met at a code pink, here's what he wrote about security. The contradictions intrinsic to the concept of security are reflected in the word security itself, derived from the Latin se cura, or without cure. Security can be understood not only as freedom from care, worries, or attention of being carefree, but also as being careless. <laughs> and it is only one of several ironies that carelessness failing to pay sufficient attention to or care for one's surroundings tends to produce conditions inimical to well-being or safety. So the whole word security is like, we gotta, you know, like, mark it. That it's, you know, and that's what we saw with the Iraq and terrorism. I mean, Code Pink, which I love to uh, work with, uh, you know, when they were warning, code orange, code yellow, code red, you know, danger, danger, they were saying, we're code pink, <laughs> peace. And I want to just close with an announcement, because code pink is doing a fast and demonstration for Yemen on Thursday, April 13th, from 10 to 2, at the Isaiah Wall, First Avenue, 42nd. This Yemen thing, I, I guess you're reading that it's, it's horrible. And we just cannot stand by. What time? Thank you. What time? So, um, 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. The Isaiah Wall on Again, my name is David Swanson. Uh, I've been uh, cutting these other speakers off, so Maria or somebody will have to tell me when to shut up. Um, okay. But I, I want to go back to one thing that Amit said when he was first up here, uh, which was that World War I gave us the, the model for war propaganda. You know, I think lies about war have existed as long as wars have. But the whole package uh, of U.S. war propaganda really was created uh, for World War I. What I talk about in my book, uh, War is a Lie, uh, started there with, with Woodrow Wilson and his crew and the Four Minute Men. Raise your hand if you know who the Four Minute Men were. One person. Uh, it, it took them four minutes to change the reels in the movie theaters, and so they would have some jerk get up and talk for four minutes about how evil the Germans were and what saints the poor Belgian children were and 
why we needed war and Jesus wanted you to kill and you know the whole demonization and racism and use of religion and the fear mongering and the glorification of violence and the, the narrowing of options I mean the whole package was there um, the another thing that World War One gave us of course was the carving up and the British and French and, and subsequently US colonization of the Middle East uh, which has just done so much good for the world all these years. Uh, another thing that World War I gave us was the incredible abuses of civil liberties, right? It wasn't just the, the effective propaganda. If you spoke against the war, you went to prison, right? And the, the Espionage Act that, that, that President Obama was so fond of using against whistleblowers, the ACLU and the other groups that have worked for civil liberties, although they will not touch opposition to war or military spending or the things that since World War I have taken away those civil liberties, all of this dates back to World War I. Um, I was just reading on the train uh, up here, which I had a couple extra hours on. you got to love the infrastructure of a nation that spends all of its money on wars. Uh, I was reading a book called In the Shadow World by Andrew Feinstein, who looks at this uh, you know, model weapons profiteer named Basil Zaharoff, who apparently, according to various accounts, you know, World War I was sort of triggered by an assassination in the Balkans. The Balkans was sort of kept violent and chaotic from the late 18th century right up to or 19th century right up to World War I uh, because this guy would go and bribe editors and bribe border guards to fire shots and stir up incidents and bribe governments to buy more weapons uh, and sell weapons to both sides just you know the, the model of what the US does today. Most wars in the world today have US weapons on both sides, and in some cases more than two sides. Um, so, you know, this too comes from World War I. Uh, which comes first, the weapons or the wars, usually has a very clear answer. It is the weapons. Uh, a good thing that came out of World War I that we have forgotten is the incredible peace movement, not just that people were right beforehand and people went to prison and people suffered and people created models of resistance and, and other movements and the civil rights movement, but the incredible peace movement that came right after World War I that was you know, stronger by far than anything we've seen before or since in this country in, in many ways, including the movement against the war on Vietnam. I mean, it was just so mainstream, so overwhelming. The people who believed that war to end all wars propaganda and the people who never did were all united on let's make it true now. Let's end war now. Let's have disarmament. Let's have peace negotiations. Let's have, uh, you know, let's actually make some good use of lawyers. Uh, I understand the, the criticism from Joanne that, you know, law alone isn't going to fix everything, but the idea that better laws rather than worse laws could do some good. Let's ban war. Let's make it criminal. Because World War I was not criminal. War was treated like the weather, as if it just happens, right up through World War I. And a lawyer from Chicago said, let's change that. If we're going to ban dueling for settling individual disputes, let's ban war for settling group disputes. And let's not just, you know, we didn't just ban aggressive dueling and keep the defensive kind, you know, humanitarian dueling. <laughs> let's ban the whole damn institution, right? And so this was what I wrote about in a book called When the World Outlawed War, because it did. Because in 1928, the, the world created the Kellogg-Briand Pact, which is still on the books, which bans all war. Um, in fact, it was mid January 16th, 1929, that the U.S. Senate ratified a treaty still on the books that has made every war since that date criminal. The day before that ratification, Martin Luther King Jr. was born. Uh, I, I was looking at Martin Luther King Jr. dates uh, and, and comments. And when President Obama was president, the lawyer for the Pentagon was a gentleman named Jeff Johnson who publicly said that if Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. were alive today, he would support all of the American wars. Actually believed this, apparently. The, the current Secretary of so-called Defense, James Mattis, uh, back on Martin Luther King uh, holiday this past January, gave a speech 
has said essentially the U.S. military was there before the Civil Rights Movement because when Lewis and Clark went to, you know, plot genocide, they allowed a slave that they brought with them to have a vote when they voted on whether to continue across some river. So don't talk to us about civil rights. You know, so, so, so on April 1st of this week, I published a press release from the Pentagon uh, announcing that they were creating a Martin Luther King Jr. award for their top recruiter each year. And a lot of people wrote back and said, ha ha, good April Fool's joke. And a lot of people believed it. Uh, and a lot of people will hate me for life now because they believed it. And then, for, you know, the sense of humor in this country has, you know, gone with everything else. But uh, it's, not, it's not far enough off to not be believable. Um, also today, in 1948, the Marshall Plan was created for Europe to actually rebuild Europe. Because it, the other thing that World War I gave us, of course, was World War II. And the, the wise observers at the conclusion of World War I, looking at how it was concluded, said that's going to give you World War II. Some of them predicted it almost to the, to the time that it started. And after World War II, things were done a little differently. It wasn't punish the hell out of the losers. It was, first of all, prosecute war as a crime under the Kellogg-Briand Pact. Do it one-sidedly, just prosecute the losers, yes, but prosecute it. And number two, build up the losing countries. Help them out. Don't push them into the next world war. And, and that co the cost of the Marshall Plan, the cost of actually helping people out after destroying their country, uh, minimal compared to what the United States now puts into destroying numerous countries around the globe. Minimal cost. Um, the, uh, the thing about, you know, I mentioned civil liberties being damaged by World War I, but this, this is what we've started looking at with this group, World Beyond War, that this website is up here, is the costs not just of a particular war, but of the whole institution of war which includes the costs to the natural environment. It is the single biggest destroyer of the natural environment. The costs to human rights, biggest violator. The financial drain, right? It, it would cost something like 3% of the US military budget to end starvation globally, including in Syria and Yemen and the places we hear about. Uh, you know, tiny percentages to end various diseases and lack of clean drinking water, et cetera. So the top way in which war kills is through the, the diversion of resources, not through some particular weapon. Um, and, and so we're working on a number of, of campaigns that we can talk about. One is getting cities and states and counties and towns to pass resolutions opposing Trump's proposal, which is to take $54 billion out of everything else almost and put it into the military, to take military spending up above 60% and with a supplemental bill up above 65% of discretionary spending, where it hasn't been since, uh, since Reagan. And, you know, it, it, it's very important that people say both sides of this, that we stop this nonsense of just opposing the things being cut without telling anybody where the money is going to. And you get opposition from the small government types, yay for cuts, right? <laughs> Until you explain to them that Trump has proposed the exact same budget as the previous year just wants to move money from everything good and decent into the military. And there's a polling company at the University of Maryland that doesn't just ask people questions, but tells them something first so they know what the hell they're talking about. Because most Americans have no idea what the federal budget looks like. So this polling group shows people the current federal budget and says, how would you change it? And the vast majority would move some 40 billion out of the military meaning there's about a $90 billion difference between what the public wants and what Donald Trump wants, right? So if you were to take a random sample of the public and assign them to fix the budget or anything else, they always do a better job than Congress or the White House uh, and, you know, would do a much better job if we let them. Uh, so a number of cities have passed good resolutions. Go to worldbeyondwar.org slash resolution, get the model resolution, adopt it to your city and pass it. We are working on building chapters in localities. We have a campaign working on divestment. It, it really is about 
the weapons profiteering. I mean, e even this Russia madness is quite openly Pentagon spokespeople are telling journalists it's for profit. It's for the profit to be gained through the Cold War. Uh, we have a campaign working on closing bases, one working on supporting international justice. Uh, we also have an online course that you can see a link there on the homepage that starts on April 10th, uh, so you still have time to sign up an online course on how to abolish war. Um, and I think Alice mentioned we pushed very hard to get the climate march to include peace, because there are always these Unify, you know, explicitly, we are unifying all movements. We are for everything good under the sun. We are for the climate and all of its intimate connections to labor rights and gay rights and everything, you know, that are all the good causes that have nothing to do with the climate. But not peace. But not opposing the single biggest destroyer of the natural environment. Uh, and so we pushed for that and won that, as we always have to do. And so there will be a, a peace contingent, uh, you know, a rally and a march into the, the larger march, uh, and then a unified rally at the end of the big march in Washington, D.C. on April 29th, and lots of buses from New York. Um, I, I, I wanted to mention, as we, I was listening to, to all of this important history about resisting uh, the draft, that there is still a big push on in Congress uh, by the Democrats to force every young woman when she becomes 18 to, like every young man when he becomes 18, register for the draft. Uh, and this is being treated not as an act of cruelty or enslavement, but as an act of defending the rights of young women against this brutal discrimination. It denies them the right to be forced into a military draft along with young men. Uh, and it, that has to be pushed back against. Uh, and, you know, I, somebody will, I'll wait for somebody to give me the pro draft uh, peace movement argument. Uh, but there are 18 reasons why it's wrong, and I'll, I'll give you some of them. Um, uh, I, I also, listening to Glenn Ford, wanted to mention that I think the Black Lives Matter platform is part of the anti-imperial tradition that gets anti-war and peace activism you know very much right uh, and better than these movements like the climate march without having to be pushed into it um, and you know so a, a lot has died among black and white and all other activism in this country but there are uh, signs of hope there um, on the other hand, this question that Glenn said people were polled on uh, when you know the president was a Republican, which I think was the key factor there, uh, of would you support a war that kills thousands of, of civilians? You know, in a presidential primary debate last year, a moderator asked a candidate, "Would you, as part of your basic responsibilities as president, kill thousands of innocent children?" All right, and this was not a news story in any media outlet anywhere. Nobody blinked. This was just normal. This was just part of the U.S. enterprise at this point. You know, that question could not have been asked ever or anywhere else on Earth. Uh, and yet goes unnoticed. And that's something that's developed in, these, in this recent period, um, as has the, the damage done to the peace movement uh, under President Obama that I, you know, I'm not sure to what extent it's going to come back and whether it's going to take a new Trump war as opposed to Trump's continuation and escalation of all the existing wars uh, or what it's going to take. Um, but I, uh, I, I want to get to questions and answers. Um, Maria, did you want to pass the hat around? And, uh, oh, and you actually have a hat. All right. Thank you all for coming out here. Oh, if you feel so moved as to support these good people, and, and me good people too, and our good work that we do, all of us on a shoestring, I know. Um, we invite you to draw some of them into the house. Is, is Amit still here? Thank you. You know how to turn this off? But so, uh, anyone have questions, comments? Yeah. Hi, my name is Irving Lee. Um, I just want to thank everybody at the committee that formed this meeting. I think it's very important. I think after the meeting, we should try to network 
together and uh, get to know each other. Um, we have problems in the anti-war movement, uh, or I would say the, the Democratic Party, which uh, Mr. Ford had pointed out. Even uh, Bernie Sanders, I got an email from Sanders people, seems to, they seem to jump on the uh, anti-Russian bandwagon also, and they're on our, our revolution. I got this, I was startled. I mean, I should be surprised, but I was a little bit startled by that, because they didn't say anything about this Russian involvement uh, until recently. And, and uh, I was at a rally uh, a few days ago at, uh, against Gorsuch, and basically they were, they were, many of them were harping the same uh, anti-Russian perspective. It seems like the Democratic Party is really jumping on this bandwagon, as, as opposed to not looking at voter suppression or their own policies is the problem. So I think we should, the panel should talk about you know, how we're going to deal with that issue. It's, it's going to be really difficult. Uh, that's obviously splitting our movement. Uh, the other question, I think, obviously, is that the, uh, uh, our movement is, um, obviously, the ruling class has, has really learned the lessons from Vietnam. And of course, they stopped the draft, even though they may want to bring it up again. But they did stop the draft. And they also created a, a situation where they created a false flag operation, which was 9-11. Of course, 9-11 was the basis of the wars that exist today, uh, the war on terror. And uh, so it's, it's obviously, they didn't, didn't, they didn't need the draft. They used this, this operation to motivate the American public to go into war. It's a volunteer army. And of course, someone would argue that it's, a, it's also an economic draft army, to, but it's nevertheless a volunteer army. And something that we have to address also, the question of the war on terror, whether or not it's valid or not. And it's clearly, Anyone who's been involved in this knows that the 9-11 movement was basically, 9-11 incident was basically a false flag operation, just like the main, to get us to a war. Okay, so how do we respond that's, to that's that? That's a lot. Let's hear from our panelists, uh, and then we'll get to the next person. Okay. Alice? I, I want to talk about the Russian bashing, because I had it in my talk, but I didn't get to it. Right. Just to think about our history, I think we have to communicate. Starting in, in in 1918, Wilson sent troops to help the Tsar against the peasants. Stalin asked Truman to turn the bomb over the UN, and we made the condition so onerous that we would have a veto and control that he said the hell with it and made his own bomb. <laughs> Gorbachev and Reagan met in Reykjavik. Gorbachev said, let's get rid of all the nuclear weapons. It's a great idea. Gorbachev said, you can't do Star Wars. Reagan says, I'm not taking Star Wars off the table, and that was the end of that. We promised Gorbachev that if they didn't object to a united Germany going into NATO, that we would not expand NATO. They lost 27 million people to the Nazi onslaught, and we now have NATO troops on their border. I mean, how would we feel if they had troops in Mexico or Canada? We know what happened when they went to Cuba. We all said World War III. And the deal that Kennedy made with Khrushchev was if they got the missiles out of Cuba, we would take ours out of Turkey. That was secret because nobody in America would let Kennedy made that deal, but he made it secretly. And they took the missiles out of Turkey, and they're back. Then, Clinton bombed Kosovo, first time a UN war without the approval of the Security Council. Russia vetoed it. And here's a quote from Clinton. If we're going to have a strong economic relationship that includes our ability to sell around the world, Europe has got to be a key. That's what this Kosovo thing is about. He, he was quoted saying that in the nation. Then Putin proposed in 2000 to Clinton, let's cut our arsenals, then they were like around 10,000, let's each go to 1,000, but don't go ahead with that ballistic missile defense system you're planning. And Clinton said, forget it, I'm not doing that. And Bush walked out of the anti-ballistic missile treaty that we had with them since 72. Um, 2008, nobody knows this, and in 2015, <laughs> China and Russia proposed a treaty to keep weapons out of space. And we blocked it in the committee. That's our military. 
we actually blocked a proposal to talk about not having a space weapons race. And then after we attacked and boasted about the virus, the Stuxnet virus that we did with Israel on Iran's enrichment, we boasted about it. Russia came back and said, hey, why don't we do a treaty to bomb, to ban cyber war? We said, forget it. So they are under siege by us. I mean, and if, and if Putin, who was the head of the Russian KGB, wanted to hack our elections, he wouldn't have used a Russian computer expert. I mean, he would have done it from, uh, you know, Georgia or uh, Alabama. <laughs> so, I, I, thank you, Alice. Uh, well, that's, you know, but the point is to just think about this, that there's answers and that this, this is ridiculous. What they're doing. Uh, I, would, I just want to add that in a few weeks I'm going to go to Russia and if they let me back in this country, uh, I'm going to talk about our meetings there with Gorbachev and everybody else that we're able to meet with. And I highly recommend, uh, you know, groups are starting up these exchanges again as during the last Cold War, and it's very important. Um, and, and just quickly, if you're, if you're going to look for problems with the U.S. election, right, you, you, you know, you the documented indisputable facts that, you know, the, the loser uh, of the popular vote is in the White House, threatened intimidation of the polls, had state secretaries of state strip people off the, the rolls, uh, fought the counting of paper ballots where they existed. I mean, there's 18 legitimate, indisputable reasons why that election is no good, and the only one that the Democrats care about is the one that we haven't seen any evidence for, but allows the blaming of a nuclear-armed government risking World War III. If you're going to go after Donald Trump, here's a guy writing unconstitutional laws every day. Here's a guy who, who's violating the domestic and the foreign emoluments clauses from day one. The argument that we put up at impeachdonaldtrumpnow.org says not one word about Russia because it sticks to things that are, that are proven. But nobody cares about proven reasons to impeach Donald Trump if they aren't anti-Russian, anti-Putin reasons that allow the claim that Hillary Clinton won, would have won the election without foreign interference. Uh, you know, and never mind if it kills us all. You know, so th th there are easy solutions for better avenues to take. Uh, it, we just have to get off the, the Putin derangement syndrome. Uh, yeah, there have been a lot of hands, so one, two, three. Hi, thanks very much for the panel. My name is Mitchell Cohen, and the panel has been fantastic, and I wish you could each expand on what you were saying. And especially, I'd like to hear Glenn continue with the pages that you waved at. I won't have time to answer this. <laughs> um, I think it's really important what each of us does. And I just talk about the flip side of what the government is doing. Let's talk about what we can do a little bit. Just the chance at all the marches are no ban, uh, no ban, no wall. Just each of us start adding no war. So it becomes no ban, no wall, no war. And I started doing that. It's easy to do. People pick it up instantly. It's not, <laughs> doesn't take a leap. And people just are there. The only reason why it's difficult to do is because the Democrats are trying to control the marches and the Democrats are all lined up for war. Uh, Schumer, Clinton, you know, all of them. And, but people instantly pick that up. And so if each of us just start doing that during the marches, I'm sure we're all going to them. That's one good thing. I wanted to point one other thing out. A few blocks away at the New School, back in 1990 and 91, before the Gulf War, there was a student there named Sam Lewin, who became a resistor. He was in the military, and he was resisting being sent to, to, Iraq, to Iraq at the time, and to Kuwait. And by himself, he didn't know what to do. And the students in his class, I mean, undergraduates, got together. I was at some of those meetings, maybe 10 people, 15 people. And so we support Sam and hands off Sam. 
And pretty soon this became a national movement called Hands Off. It got abbreviated to support all resistors inside the military who wanted to resist and who were trying to resist. Sam was then empowered to go back and he organized his whole platoon up in the Bronx to resist. A lot of people of color mostly, people who don't know about this anymore, don't remember it, but during the Gulf War there were more resistors at that time per capita than there were in the Vietnam War, which had a lot, including the fragging that was going on and that helped end the Vietnam War as well. So just little groups of people, two and three people here, support people who are resisting, help them organize that resistance. People were going to armories and giving out flyers and talking to people. It's been going on for a couple of years now. And it's things that we can do that are really important and I think would have a profound effect on the ability of this government to wage wars around the world. Very, very good. Let, let's take two more questions that I already pointed out. Yeah. Thank you very, very much. I was listening very carefully to the history of war resistance. But I believe that there's another side of the coin. Why is war being fought? Who is the real enemy when it comes to having wars? And nobody in this panel discussed it. Nobody dealt with it at all. Because if we don't know who the real enemy is, then all the war resistance uh, elements is reinventing the wheel over and over and over again. And I would like to ask the panel, do you have any ideas of who the real enemy is? Thanks. Let's take one more question and then we'll try to answer all those. Yeah. Uh, hi. Uh, thank you, uh, everyone, the panelists, for today. Um, so I have two questions, and they relate to understanding better um, how Martin Luther King Jr.'s anti-war politics, uh, or understanding his anti-war politics better, um, and also how they how they relate to some of the things that were said today on the panel. So one question is, um, did Martin Luther King Jr.'s anti-war politic include an anti-imperialism beyond anti-US imperialism, um, such as recognizing the imperialism of Russia, Iran, Saudi Arabia, etc.? And then two, uh, how did and or how does uh, Martin Luther King Jr.'s anti-imperialist values uh, relate to social justice in the countries I mentioned, plus Syria, Libya, China. Uh, so I'd love to hear your thoughts on those two. Thank you. Anybody want to go first? Well, science, the science to that question, uh, I, I, I'm not aware of that having existed for a couple of thousands of years either. Uh, but, you know, uh, Dr. King felt, and he said so, uh, that a, a person's primary responsibility uh, is is to uh, uh, do a critique of one's own government. Uh, uh, that that is the, the 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 first obligation of the citizen. But but he he quite clearly understood that there was one uh, imperialism in the world uh, that was responsible for being the big, biggest purveyor of violence in the world. That that imperialism, if that's what you're going to call it, uh, call it, uh, that that great power was the United States. And that there was no need, I uh, think, felt no need uh, to denounce a Soviet Union that was not committing nearly as much violence as the United States, his country, uh, whose politics he uh, could have some uh, effect on. So I don't know where you're going with with your question about, you know, the failings of Dr. Martin Luther King uh, to uh, sufficiently denounce Iran, uh, yeah. which at that time was under a Shah who was, uh, had been uh, uh, installed by the United States. And one could say that was really the United States too, whatever Iran was guilty of. Anybody else? I, if not, I, I just add that uh, Martin Luther King in that speech 50 years ago tomorrow did begin by saying to, you know, the predictable critics, I am not painting as paragons of virtue other nations, governments, and forces that commit their own sins, but as Glenn said, I'm dealing with the biggest purveyor of violence on earth uh, as his responsibility. He also said, I've had this additional responsibility put on me 
of having been given a Nobel Peace Prize. He sort of admitted that he hadn't actually earned yet, but he was going to earn it. Damn it. And so decades later, the Nobel Committee sees a black man put in the White House and say, here's, a, here's another guy who hasn't heard, earned a Nobel Peace Prize yet. Let's give him one and see what happens. And, and one might have predicted what was going to happen. They got the first pro-war Nobel Peace Prize acceptance speech uh, and the only one to denounce a previous laureate, uh, namely Martin Luther King Jr. Um, in, in terms of this question of uh, why in the world we will not say who it is who wants war and benefits from war and gives us war, um, maybe we're just giving the wrong answer, but when I said it is the weapons that come first, and the weapons profiteers are openly talking now, with shamelessly, unlike the period after World War I, where weapons profiteering was considered shameless and shameful and disreputable, it is now openly discussed, we got to have more wars to sell more weapons. Uh, you know, when I went in War is a Lie through all the types of lies used for wars, I then went to the obvious next question, well then what's the truth? Why do people want to create wars? Uh, and I looked at the weapons profiteering, at the political calculations, at the, at the power uh, hunger, and concluded in the end that you could give all the rational explanations and you still needed insanity uh, to, to explain the creation of these wars. It, it, it really is a, a madness, as Dr. King said. Um, yeah, I want to speak to a couple of the things that were said. I guess I'll maybe pick up from where David ended. I live in southeastern Connecticut, the submarine capital of the world. And so, and I was active with the community for nonviolent action that moved there in 1960, or went there, to oppose the building of the Polaris submarine system. I moved there in 1976 to protest the uh, Trident submarine system, and now we are going into this third phase of building more and more submarines for the next 30 years as part of this multi-billion dollar effort. Um, and so I see general dynamics being responsible. I see the local politicians, no matter how liberal they are, are all for those submarines. And the people, and, and the, the fact that there's no support for any alternative, and so basically all the people in my community are about kind of, you know, build these subs. When there was a layoff, a massive layoff after the end of the Cold War as part of the peace dividend, the call was save our state, save our subs. That, that we are so identified, and we are only one of hundreds of communities around the country so identified with the need to build these weapons. And so all of these um, ridiculous excuses are developed as to why we really need them, but really it's, it's a jobs program that's very inefficient, so it becomes a corporate profit program. Mm -hmm. um, and so as somebody who's done economic conversion, it's difficult because you are in the belly of the beast when you are trying to come up with those um, those alternatives. So maybe that's a segue to the next thing in terms of, I'm glad you brought up Sam Lewin, because I think that whether it be opposing the buildup of nuclear weapons or supporting war resistors, we need both what's happening in the local communities um, as well as kind of that national level of coordination. I met Sam because he came to the war resistors league, because Michael Marsh, who was on staff, did a lot of support for those resistors as WRL has been doing, in the, as I said before. So I do think, I think the marches are not going to be enough. We're going into very, very hard times. I mean, the, as somebody who's a nonviolence trainer, you might have guessed that by right? how many times I talked about other trainers who were, who were resistors, um, we're getting lots of calls. I'm very heartened by that. We're getting lots of requests. We're, just did a training for trainers up in New England with War Sisters League. We're doing um, work on expanding our website. We're doing, because there's just such a response out there. But one of the things that bothers me is there's a lot of people who have no idea how nonviolent social change has ever happened. So they, the demonstrations are just not enough. We need, movements are made of campaigns and events not just events, not just demonstrations. So we've got to get serious about how do we both support the grassroots, 
with levels of skills and education, tools, ideas, tactics, but then also how do we kind of coordinate um, with one another. And we're really, I, and here obviously I'm talking about the grassroots, I'm not talking about the Democratic Party, no matter how much they try to kind of take some credit. I think they actually want a lot of distance from a lot of the stuff we're doing. And, I'm happy with the, as much distance as, as we can get. So I think there's really that coordinated effort of, of building up the grassroots and kind of understanding how change has happened and how we, we have to be, we're, we're not even, I'm not even sure what the next campaign is. I just know that people need the skills to be able to do it and be able to get past um, just doing demonstrations, not to say we don't do them, but there has to be more than that. Go ahead. I, I, I love my idea for the next campaign. She says modestly, you know, there's all the sports with the football champions and the baseball. Why don't we have a world energy series? <laughs> like Jerry Brown saying great stuff in California. You know, why doesn't New York compete? You know, there's millions of jobs. There's millions of jobs. They're clean. The planet's dying. We can't forget it. I mean, war is terrible, but you know that that's we all have to. Those are the two existential crises: the climate, the climate, and blowing ourselves up with nuclear weapons. You know. So, and I just want to say, New York City, we are so blessed because we have like the Saudi Arabia of wind. <laughs> and we have a very shallow seabed that goes out over the horizon, so you don't even have to look at the windows. <laughs> you know, they were hysterical up in Massachusetts. I, I sort of relate because I like to see the horizon. But we don't Long need Island's a successful wind power now, though. Just, yeah, like one little thing, but we need to, you know, I don't know where de Blasio is. I mean, why? Mm. Cuomo wants to give $78 billion in subsidies to nuclear power. You could put a solar roof on every right. house in New York State for that price. You know, or insulate every bit, whatever. Anyway, I think that's, there's really a hopeful thing here, you know, with the energy. That's really something we could do that would put everybody to work, that would help the planet, and that wouldn't make war. You know, you wouldn't, we spend $50 billion a year in peacetime to protect the oil tankers that are going back and forth. Yeah. But let's get just a few more questions uh, if we have them and then try to wrap up. So we got one, two, three. Perfect. <laughs> I'm going to read these words so that you can comment because this day should not go by without this. In the councils of government, we must guard against the acquisition of unwanted influence, whether sought or unsought by the military-industrial complex. The potential for the disastrous rise of misplaced power exists and will persist. Who in our government seeks out the influences of the military-industrial complex? Hold on, hold on. Two more questions. Two more questions. Um, you talked about military-industrial complex, but I call it the military-industrial educational complex. And I want to know how any of the panelists get the message that peace is not the way, an anti-war message to schools, to high schools especially, where the recruiters are hanging out, engaging young people to be the next level in the military. Trump, uh, Trump wants to increase the military, the Department of Defense, and the troops with the tax cuts and getting the taxes for uh, war. How do we get this to our kids, to our students, that have to know that peace is the way? Good. One more. Yeah. Let's make it the uh, military industrial educational media complex. <laughs> um, I have heard, and I have not heard this anywhere in, in mainstream media, that Putin is reducing the uh, Russian military budget by 25 percent. This has, as far as I can tell, not been reported here at all. While while uh, Mr. What's-His-Name wants to put, it, put it up $54 billion more here. So what's with our media? Yeah. Can, can we maybe have some concluding remarks from each person up here? Uh, you want to start down there with Glenn and come this way? Would that work? Oh, I feel kind of a little bit disconnected because I don't have any uh, anything to report about keeping these recruiters out of schools. Right, I, I don't even have any connection to education. Mm -hmm. but, um, but I want to talk about this, this uh, 
the gentleman talked about the war on terror. And if, we, if we're talking about fake news, this may be the fakest news of the, of the 21st century. Uh, the United States and Saudi Arabia uh, creating something that never had existed on the face of the earth. Uh, there have always been folks that you could describe as jihadists or talk theories, uh, but there has never, had never been an international jihadist network <clears throat> until the U.S. and the Saudis, with the help of uh, Zia al-Haq in Pakistan, created the international jihadist network uh, to uh, not not to to uh, fight the Soviet uh, in, in, in intervention in Afghanistan, but to defeat uh, the leftist uh, government uh, that had overthrown a king uh, in Afghanistan, uh, and who had sent cadres out into the into the hinterlands away from Kabul uh, on missions of land reform and uh, education of women and all these things that. Uh, left progressive Americans claim uh, that they're for, and they were arriving with their heads, their heads were being sent back uh, to Kabul. Uh, Zbigniew Brzezinski brags that, uh, the, that, that helping to make the Mujahideen, who were just the most backward uh, elements uh, of warlords uh, and feudal landowners back then, uh, into a a viable military force uh, would bring the Russians into the Soviets, into Afghanistan. That that was the bait uh, to get them embroiled uh, in in their morass. Uh, so so the, the jihadist network, international jihadist network, was created not even against the Soviets. It was created in order to uh, undermine and subvert. Uh, a secular uh, leftist regime. And they have built it up uh, ever since to the point that in the Muslim world, uh, that is the only way that the United States uh, is able to project power. Because there is no social base uh, in, in that part of the world for U.S. Uh, policy. And so they have to kind of hijack a very right reactionary uh, base of, of Wahhabism which is why that they're, they're in uh, a partnership with the Saudis. And so this, this whole war on terror uh, is, it revolves around a U.S. Uh, war-making uh, invention, uh, a social base uh, that they uh, nurtured in collaboration with the Saudis in order to make war against secular uh, regimes. And everything uh, that we've seen has flowed from that. I believe that the great crisis that, that they now face, and there are many, uh, in Syria and uh, Iraq, is that uh, although these uh, Islamic jihadists are quite reactionary, uh, their movement behaves in many ways uh, like a nationalism, uh, and sometimes is, is intertwined with uh, nationalisms. Uh, and therefore has contradictions with imperialism. Imperialism seeks to abolish everybody's uh, uh, claim uh, to uh, uh, sovereignty, national sovereignty, or, or any religious kind of Uma claim uh, to something like a sovereignty. Uh, the imperialism uh, wants to obliterate uh, uh, all sovereignties except its own. And so there are real contradictions uh, between uh, these, these jihadists that the United States uh, has empowered and armed and trained, uh, and U.S. imperialism. And that is expressed in ISIS. That's where that crisis comes from. And that's why ISIS is the rogue of their cultivated jihadists. Um, I think we have to look at what, we're, what we can do because actually this thing is falling apart. I mean, the fact that everybody showed up at the airport was so incredible. It wasn't even organized. Like, there's a new energy. What was going on in the UN last week, it was like a miracle that they were. 
And I think one of the things that we can do from our perspective in the empire is the divestment campaigns. Once they say this June that nuclear weapons are illegal, you can go to your school pension and your school, you know, and your city pensions and your invest and say they're illegal because they were trying to do it in Europe. You know, they did it with chemical and biological weapons. But the banks say, well, they're not illegal. So that's one good thing of getting them illegal. It's not like just because they're illegal, we're going to get rid of them. But we can start making a dent in like divestment campaigns. We should definitely look for that. Because you quoted Eisenhower. And by the way, part of that speech, besides military industrial complex, he talked about the academic establishment that's in cahoots with them. You know, he named all of it. So I think. We have to make our impact as Americans living here on the military industrial complex and divestment is a good way to store. Wow. Um, so I think that, I hope that part of what I got across here is um, that we in the peace movement sometimes think that people who join the military, they're different from us. They can kill. Well, they can't either not without consequences. And I think that some of our you know, closest allies should be those kids that are at risk for recruitment. You know, I don't use the terminology even all volunteer military to try to talk about it all recruited military because that's what they are. And uh, some of the service members can absolutely be some of our closest allies in this movement. Uh, Obama dropped 26,000 bombs in eight years. Uh, Trump is already, you know, on track to have his tenure see more drop, bombs dropped than that. You know, the, the, the generals and the CIA have uh, greater authority to conduct strikes without his permission. The Obama rule of not dropping bombs unless there was near certainty, you know, the heck that means, that civilians wouldn't be killed, is gone, and we saw the effects of that in Mosul. Uh, and so then that translates to the reality for people's lives, obviously the civilians and the others who are killed on our, you know, quote unquote opponent's side, but then the folks that, uh, you know, that, that are, uh, you know, members of the United States community, not all citizens, uh, but people who fight on the side of the United States. And, and these kids who are joining, because uh, I talk to them every day, they're not joining because they're choosing to kill. They're joining because they're thinking they're going to do something better than themselves and, and access something better than themselves. Mm -hmm. And because of this and increased suicide rate, absolutely, 20 veterans a day, one active duty service member a day. Service members have killed themselves in higher numbers than ISIS has killed any U.S. Mm -hmm. service member. Uh, that is the truth of the matter, and that has been true in every year that we've counted uh, since 2010. U U.S. service members took their own lives, active duty, uh, then died in combat. Uh, a recruiter's quota, uh, in general, is two individuals a month. To recruit two individuals a month, we have billions of dollars dedicated to the recruiting budget. So I think we need an honest and transparent and open discussion of what it really means to support the troops. Not only is Trump cutting you know, human services in the civilian sector, but part of his bloated DOD budget actually includes cuts to DOD health care. So when you have drone pilots being asked to kill more civilians, when you have more boots on the ground, when you have increased, increased focus on militarization and decreased focus on diplomacy, that is inevitably going to result in more trauma experienced by service members, more folks coming home and hopefully being mobilized into <coughs> you know, the peace and justice movement. I, I, everybody has in every school district an inherent right for equal access for an alternative to the recruiter sales pitch. But our experience when I was in New Mexico was that DOD was watching what we were doing and DOD shut us down at the state level. So you have to persevere. I believe New York has equal access won and guaranteed. I mean, it's there, it exists in, in, in court uh, decisions, but we need to get veterans into the classroom. We need to have an honest and open discussion of how military life affects not just the people that we call our opponents, but also the people, you know, who we call our, um, our troops, our own troops, so. Um, yeah, one of the things that I've done a lot of in the last 20 years is going to the schools. Um, that uh, through War Resisters League, we've developed a lot of counter recruitment materials over the years, and my own son got very interested in this, and so that got me into the first school I got into. Um, 
and um, the military is there every week, you know, the Navy one week, the, the Army the next, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but I think that, um, and it continues, War Sisters League has a, a lot of um, material from kind of the, uh, it's not just a job, it's eight years of your life, which is intense, but now we're putting out POM cards and we're working with the National Network opposed to militarization of youth. And so there's much more of an effort to kind of say, okay, here's materials, let's really get it out there, do more of a kind of campaign to really get that kind of stuff out there. So I think that that's really um, important, and I'm hoping that there'll be an increased interest in people going into the schools, because as Maria said, they have a multi-billion dollar budget just to do that kind of recruiting, and for us to just kind of find the volunteers to get in the schools, and I, I think, you know, I didn't want to just be one of the gray-haired old ladies there, so I worked with <laughs> developing relationships with the kids, giving support to a youth peace group. My job was to train the kids to do the counter recruitment, not for me to be part of the older crowd going in. And then we would take them out of the school and do weekends in Voluntown, the old community for nonviolent action, where we could give them even more radical education than we could in the classroom. To me, I've always kind of felt like going into the classroom, you're watched and it's difficult get, being in the hallways in that kind of equal access or getting the kids out of the school and doing that education, you can really give them much more of a sense of their own empowerment, which they don't always have um, in the schools. And then also just, I think, around the military industrial complex education <laughs> media. To go back to what I had said about um, the, particularly the World War II resistors and the level of constructive program they did, right? We wouldn't have democracy now all over the country necessarily if it wasn't for Roy Kepler who said, oh, let's start an alternative media radio station, right? And I remember at the, um, right before, right after 9-11, people would say, how do you get our news? And uh, Democracy Now! was on about eight stations at that time. It's hundreds and hundreds now, I don't even know what the number is. But that's just an example of when there's a need and an ability to kind of fill it, that we need to be there. So we need to be looking more and more at all of the, these areas. So, you know, I did economic conversion work 30 years ago, and when we talk about alternative energy, but you know, there weren't enough models in this country. Now there are, now it's real, so now we can, General Dynamics is never going to con you know, convert. That's not the job. That's not my job as, a, as an organizer. It's to begin to, to develop the other jobs in real community economic development, because most people don't want to build submarines once they really understand what they're doing. They don't want to work for those kind of corporations. But they're stuck because there's not a whole lot of other jobs in a lot of those particularly engineering areas or in working class and you know, go into the yard with them in high school education. So we need to keep working on those alternatives. Um, very quickly, yes, uh, Russia has cut its military spending from about $70 billion U.S. three years ago to $48 billion U.S. now. To put that in some perspective, there are about 20 countries on Earth that spend over $10 billion a year on militarism. Nine of them are in NATO. Another eight are allies of the United States. Uh, the other three, including Russia uh, and China and Iran, are potential U.S. allies uh, if the U.S. took a very different approach to the world. Uh, but that one demonized uh, force of global evil out there, Russia, uh, has cut its military spending of part of its, its sinister plot of world domination <laughs> down to $48 billion. While the United States is well over $700 billion a year with dramatic increases planned and not counting secret budgets and not counting all sorts of other military spending and interest on military debt and so forth. Uh, so, you know, there never before has been the sort of thing uh, as the U.S. military and the expense involved with a record set by Barack Obama and <laughs> likely to be shattered by Donald Trump uh, if we don't stop him. But, you know, it, it, it's not a Department of Defense, no matter what they call it. There's nothing defensive about it. Uh, and it certainly is not defending democracy to spend that kind of money on this criminal enterprise when the public is dramatically against it and in favor of huge cuts to the military, not huge increases to the military. Uh, on the military industrial complex, I think it is worth noting that if you read that whole speech by President Eisenhower on his day out the door, 
He blames Russia for all of it. Right? Read the whole speech. And Eisenhower knew before he became president, he gave an even better speech on the same topic. It's not like he found this out, it just happened. It happened significantly because of World War I. World War I, years and years before, you know, the veterans of which were attacked in the streets of Washington, D.C. with chemical weapons by the future heroes of World War II. This is, this is when the military-industrial complex got its foothold. This is when taxes got their foothold, right? You, you know, which came first? The weapons or the wars or the taxes? The weapons, and then the wars, and then the taxes, which were supposed to go away. And if you love World War II and you're not fond of taxes, you got a real problem, right? Because ordinary people weren't taxed until World War II. And it's never stopped. It's never gone away. The troops have never left Germany or Japan. And the military industrial complex has never shut down. And World War II rolls on and on. Uh, so uh, I, I, I think on the counter recruitment question, um, you know, one thing you can do is get the military tests out of the schools. Right, right. Another thing you can do is get. Uh, the ability for students to know that they are military tests and to opt out of the military tests and to allow parents to exercise their legal right to opt out from having their kids information and contact information given to the military. There's one state, Maryland, that on a form that it sends to parents, a mandatory form that the parents all have to check things on, they include a box for do you want to opt out from having all your kids information sent to the US military. In the other 49 states, the parents have to go out of their way Right? So, you know, an organization that, that Joanne mentioned, you know, can help you work on getting these kinds of laws passed in your county or city or state. Um, go to studentprivacy.org. Uh, get a new book on counter-recruitment by Pat Elder uh, that is excellent. Um, and get the videos made by the Veterans for Peace chapter in the United Kingdom. With the uh, with the toy action figures, you know the PTSD action man and the you know the the destroyed veterans action figures that are, are quite powerful. Um, show the video of this event, you know. <laughs> Teach the books and writings of these people, you know. And get into students' heads with other ideas. Um, finally, I would I would say that we need if we're going to envision a world beyond war. We have to give people, you know, what seem like outlandish fantasies that we don't even dare imagine, but are absolutely real and existent. Uh, you know, I, I came up here on a train uh, that, you know, I was lucky it stayed on the tracks, you know, but it was hours and hours of rolling through, you know, devastated uh, towns to get here. You know, well, in Copenhagen, Denmark, they just decided to build a new power plant, and rather than put it far away, they put it right next to downtown and made it so clean that it's got the cleanest air, cleaner than the other air around it, and put a ski slope on top of the power plant so that you can go to the top of the power plant, breathe the clean mountain air of the electricity production, and ski down the thing. And we're lucky if the trains stay on the goddamn track. Right? This is the difference. right? It's not just a power plant. It's free college. It's free preschool. It's free top quality education from preschool through college. It's retirement. It's vacation. It's health care. It's everything you dare dream of guaranteed as a human right for slightly higher taxes, but none of the fees, none of the debts, none of the co-pays, and none of the wars. Right? This is the choice. The places with the greater lifespans, the greater happiness, the greater security in a real sense of that word, do not have the level of military spending. They don't have the same level of billionaires hoarding wealth, but they, far more importantly, you know, in a question of funds that dwarfs the money hoarded by the billionaires, they do not have this dumping of an unfathomable sum into military spending every year. So if you want to imagine a world beyond war, look around. Look at the things the rest of the world is dreaming up and doing, and then start daring to think that the United States could have a few of those things too. Thank you all for coming out here.
Oh, yeah. But um, he's done a lot of that Columbia work, right? I yeah. Mean, tried to raise up those voices also, I think. At least that's what I mean. He seems like a great guy in doing like, that kind of thing. Yeah. 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 Plays at the table for the people who should have a place at the table. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no, I'm with you. I've been in contact with him. I'm not in contact with him for the years. Like, yeah, working with him. Six days a week. Oh, right. No, they didn't. And it's great. Right. 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 No. Yeah, so she, uh, you know, uh, at Ellen, she was like, uh, and George, uh, oh, yes, I did hear, yes. I did. Uh, 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 and go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, no, I, I was going to say, she's the most well known environment and human rights indigenous activists in Honduras and I would say arguably in the Americas at that time and um, or, yeah, I'm sorry um, before she received the um, <laughs> 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 